Hello, hello. Good morning. Checking mic. One, two, three. Hello. Checking mic. One, two, three. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. Um, thank you for coming in today. Uh, for those of you who are here at 1077 St. James, we welcome you and thank you for uh, making it today. And for those who are watching all around the world um, online, Thank you for um, tuning in and welcome to our English service um, today. So we have um, some announcements that we will make. Um, please uh, check in on our social media pages and Facebook, Instagram, and our um, website for more of that. And first, we, will, um, we would like to invite you to celebrate with us our third We are actually on the third week of our month-long celebration of our 25th um, anniversary as a church. And yesterday, um, one event that we had was at Brandon, and it was um, uh, under the charge of uh, IWC Brandon. So we thank you for those who attended, who supported, and who were there, who were there yesterday. <clears throat> and next weekend, it's our, um, it's our outreach at Gilbert Park. That's at Kuwait in area, and we invite you to come, invite your friends, invite your classmates, your workmates, and it's going to be fun. And um, it is part of our celebration as a church. Um, instead of just celebrating it here inside the building, we want to celebrate it outside and reach out to other people as well. And that's going to be 1 to 5 p.m. And <clears throat> you know that um, that event, the outreach at Gilbert Park. It was spearheaded by a life group, and a, a group of life groups or a network. And um, so I encourage you that if you want to uh, be a part of a life group and you know um, share your love with the people around you, um, please email us at lifegroups at iwcenter.com. Next, we have our um, YA um, camp. It's entitled Fresh. It's going to be held at Red Rocks Bible Camp um, from June 10 to 12, and the camp fee is $150. It is for um, uh, young adults ages 19 and onwards. And we encourage you to join because this is really refreshing, and um, this is really worth your time. And we also want to invite you to our... <clears throat> Paradigm event for the Uprising Youth Camp. Um, this is for ages 13 to 17, and it's going to be on July 21 to 24 at the Manhattan Beach Retreat Center. And I encourage you guys that if you if you wanna if you will not be able to attend yourself, or if you don't have anyone to invite, you can sponsor um, a teenager to this camp, and the church will match it. It's kind of like um, buy one get one. So you sponsor one, and then the, the church will match that, and you will be sponsoring two teenagers to that camp. And in preparation for these um, camps for the young adults and the um, youth, the church will be holding a prayer and fasting week from June 6, that's uh, Monday, to June 12, that's the Sunday. So we will be praying that all the young adults and youth will encounter God powerfully while they are in the camp. We will pray for the attendees, the um, speakers, as well as the volunteers who will be joining that camp. And if you want to be a part of um, that prayer and fasting week, please talk to your leaders and they will guide you on how to be a part of this. And we have um, sign-up sheets outside in the Welcome Center um, if you want to check that out later. And on June 8th, we will have our prayer meeting. So usually we, we have our prayer meeting on the first Wednesdays of every month, but for the month of June, we will be holding it on June 8th. So we encourage you guys to join with us and pray for the people outside of our church. And lastly, we want to thank you all. We want to thank you all for continuously giving and supporting our church financially. And we thank you that you are doing so cheerfully and faithfully. And these, here are the ways to give. It's um, flash on the screen. So lastly, um, is there anyone here? This is uh, first. It's, it's, it's your first time to attend this church. Could you raise up your hands? 
And we have ushers who will give you something special, uh, a gift for to, just to welcome you. And thank you. Thank you for coming in. So are we ready to praise the Lord? Can we all stand up and let's open in prayer before we go to our uh, songs? Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for your love. We thank you, God, that you compel us with your love to reach out and to love the people around us, Father. And we pray, God, that for today we will um, be a blessing to the people around us and we will be blessed by your word, changed by it, and be compelled by your love, Jesus. We glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's, uh, let's worship the Lord this morning. Come fill, come fill our hearts. 
breath with everything that is inside of us God because you are more than worthy and deserving of it all oh God thank you for giving us life in our darkest moments um, for being our light and our hope thank you for your unconditional love and just Lord for um, your redemption and your grace God for restoring all of our broken pieces Lord when it all seemed so hopeless God you um, took our ruins and turned them into something great and something beautiful, oh God. So we thank you, Lord, and we love you. And um, for the rest of our lives, God, we're going to sing and we're going to praise and we're going to worship you, God. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yung panahon na nagsisimula po kami sa IWC, may mga marami pagkakataon na nagkakaroon kami ng mga, mga delay, mga pagkukulang, dahil eh, wala pa kami pastor nung panahon na yon. So ang pastor namin, mga imbitado lang from other churches. May magka, pagkakataon na hindi mo inaasahan yung pastor na dapat dumating sa takdang panahon, sa takdang oras, ay wala pa. So, ang gagawin namin, mga precious and worship singer, mga leaders, ang gagawin namin eh, habang kumakanta at wala pa si pastor, meron sumesenyas doon sa likod ng ano, sasabihin pa, wala, wala pa. Ibig sabihin, wala pa si pastor. So, ang gagawin nung nagpapakanta, ikot, iikot na naman yung kakantahin. So, abang pinaiikot yung kanta, syempre mahaba. So, agad sa makarating yung pastor, ay, nako, salamat dumating na si pastor. Ah, tuwan-tuwa na kami noon. Kasi, biro nyo yung pag-iintay yung mga churchgoer. Ganun na lang. So, yun po ang mga isa sa mga nakakatuwang mga pangyayari sa loob ng simbahat. Uh, ayun po at eh, malaking pasasalamat ko at hanggang ngayon, uh, andito pa rin ako sa IWC. Uh, patuloy na magpapalakas. At uh, eto, yung ibang mga kasabayan ko noon, eh, iniwan na rin kami. At uh, nandun na siya sa heaven. <coughs> ako po si Danny Raimundo na isa sa mga pioneer ng IWC. Nagsimula po kami noong 1997 sa Elgin Street. Good morning, guys. Welcome to our English worship service. To those who are here at the 1077 St. James Street, and to those who are watching online, welcome to our worship service. Now, next Sunday will be our 25th anniversary celebration, and so that would be at 10.15 in the morning. And so everybody will be here, and so I hope and pray that you guys will find a way To be here earlier, parking-wise, it's going to be a, definitely a challenge, but at the same time, finding seats. So our, our, our church families in Winnipeg and Brandon, they will also be joining us that Sunday. And then from June 6 to 12, we're having a prayer and fasting for uh, IWC beyond 25 years. We're also, of course, going to be praying for our camps Uh, so that our young people will hear God's call to himself and God's call for their lives. And so after the service, if you want to commit to a, a, a day or two or more to fast from June 6 to 12, please sign up at our um, info center, okay? So please take note of that. And also uh, for our rest young adult camp that will be on june 10 to 12 if you haven't signed up yet you're 18 and above early 30s of course not all the way to 800 or 79 <laughs> but uh, for our young adults please do sign up it's going to be at the red rock bible camp and if you have kids ages 18 you know in that category in that age group please do sign them up that would be a perfect time to Just hang out with friends and people of the same age and, and, and interest. And then give, we give you the opportunity to encounter God in a very powerful, powerful way. Okay? So that's all. 
So we are continuing on our series entitled Compelled by Love. This was actually the scripture, a verse spoken by Paul, that it was the love of God that compelled him to do the things that he was doing. And you know what? I believe that love is definitely a powerful thought, a powerful emotion, a powerful devotion. You know what? When we're reading the book, the Gospels in the New Testament, I love the stories of Jesus encountering different kinds of people, Jesus having a conversation with different kinds of people. You know, there was a pastor who founded the, the People's Church in Toronto. His name is Pastor o, o, Oswald Smith. He wrote a moving hymn about the difference Jesus made on people's lives as he passed by. Take, for instance, the encounter of the blind man in Jericho, the encounter. He encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Smith wrote, once sat alone beside the highway begging. This is actually a hymn that he wrote. He said that once sat alone beside the highway begging, his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness to flee. I love those encounters. I love reading and witnessing the power of having a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the story went this way. In Luke chapter 18, there was a commotion. And the blind man asked, why is there a commotion? They said that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And after he heard that, he started crying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so the Lord stopped and asked the man, what do you want? The Lord knew he was blind, but he wanted the man to specifically ask what he was asking him for and why he was crying out for him to stop by and meet with him. And the man said, I want new eyesight. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying him. Many more encounters with the Lord of healings and miracles and transformed lives can be read in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And last week, we studied about the encounter that Jesus had with a religious law expert, an expert on the law. And it ended up, you know, going into the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus explaining to this expert of the law that to be a good person, you have to be immersed in love. You have to be a loving person. And that is how we got to know the story of the parable of, or the parable of the Good Samaritan. But one of the greatest and the most significant encounters and conversations Jesus had was with Peter, one of his apostles. Because this encounter will not just transform the life of Peter, but also transform the lives of many people. Even in our time, we're still reading the book of First Peter, Second Peter. We're reading his epistles, his stories. We read in the Gospels. In fact, the most mentioned name in the Gospel is that of the Apostle Peter. Why? Because Paul, because Jesus had a good plan and call for this man. But we all know, if not most of us know the story, how he denied that he knew the Lord thrice. After Jesus was arrested, after Jesus was, you know what, uh, um, um, brought into uh, the Sanhedrin, he, G, uh, Peter denied that he knew the Lord thrice. Even after he promised that he will go to prison with him and die for him. He was such a failure. But in John chapter 21, Jesus planned this conversation, this encounter, to bring about a champion of faith in Peter. I would like us to go in John chapter 21. We will not be reading the whole story. But the context of the story was that P Peter asked his other disciples, or he, the other disciples, if they wanted to join him to go fishing. We all know the background of, of Peter and his brother Andrew and their business, business partners, John and James, that they were fishermen. In fact, they were great fishermen at that. 
But the encounter they had with the Lord was at a time when they could not even catch a single fish. And so in a moment of great confusion, because after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, He was never constant with them in the same manner previous to the Lord's death and burial and resurrection. In fact, the Scripture says that this will be the only third time that Jesus met the disciples after His resurrection. And so Peter, confused, together with the other disciples, what to do with their lives and what the future is all about, decided to go fishing. And in the process, they experience, again, the same thing that they have experienced in Luke chapter 5, that Peter experienced in Luke chapter 5. There was no catch. The experts didn't, didn't catch anything. And lo and behold, the Lord gave them a miracle catch. And so let's go to John chapter 21, starting at verse 7 to 19. And they recognized that the one that they were speaking at or speaking with was the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, that was, that was John the Beloved, the writer of the book of John, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The other stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. You no, know, Jesus didn't just provide them a miracle catch. Jesus provided them breakfast. And again, Jesus was doing this act of kindness, providing them an encounter of His miraculous power. He was doing this to men and women, or to men who decided to run away and hide out of fear that they will also be arrested and in the process could even be executed. And yet God is demonstrating love and mercy and kindness to these men. So they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. And there were 153 large fish. <coughs> and this was the third time Jesus had appeared to this disciple since he had been raised from the dead. And after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, specifically Simon Peter, he asked him a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. We have learned last week that, the, that if we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that what follows is loving our neighbors the way we love ourselves, meaning that we will care for others. We will serve others. We cannot say that we love the Lord and we're not doing anything. We're not doing anything about the concerns of others. We're not doing anything about the salvation of those who are not yet in Christ. Those who are still far from God. We can see here that the commitment of love also requires a commitment of service. Peter replied, you know I love you. The second question again, Jesus asked, Simon son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know, I love you. Then take care of my sheep. And Jesus said the third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you like. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And Jesus told him, follow me. Now let me be clear with something. The mighty Peter was a mighty failure. During the time that he was following Jesus, before Jesus was arrested and crucified, Peter was always putting himself ahead of everybody else. He was always putting himself forward and saying, you know what, I would even go to prison with you and I will even die for you. Peter was one such person who is confident in self, is definitely 
self-evident. Self-confidence. Was Peter's last name. <laughs> Self-righteousness was Peter's other name. <laughs> Always putting himself forward. Always putting himself ahead of everybody else. But mighty Peter was a mighty failure. But the good thing about this story is that it, you know what? When this happened to us, when somebody betrays us, denies that they know us, or like or, or, or run away from us in our in our in our darkest moment or in our most difficult times, I think most of us will write these people off or this kind of people off. But not God, not Jesus. God is a God of second chances. God, God had a good plan for Peter. And Jesus specifically talk to Peter to bring that plan into the surface in spite of what, G what Peter did. So even though Peter was a failure, Jesus did not give up on Peter. His past was not his future as far as God was concerned. This conversation brought the future into existence, into the surface. But God wanted Peter to deal with the past as well. Because before he can move forward in the direction of God's future, he needed to deal with the past. At that moment, at that present, he needed to deal with his failure. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 32, the Lord clearly stated what Satan was planning concerning him. He said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, meaning cut you off, separate you from me. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. You know, if you come to think of it, Jesus said something, whatever he says is law. And yet Peter rejected this statement. He said, no, Lord, I will go to prison with you and I will die for you. That's where he said that statement. That famous commitment and promise to go to prison with Jesus, to die for Jesus, even after Jesus said, your faith will struggle. Satan is asking for you, but I am going to pray for you. He insisted that he can and will be faithful to the very end, even if it costs his life. But the reality of the matter is we know the story because the story is already written in the Bible that Peter denied that he knew the Lord and not just once, but thrice. And why? Well, back then before Jesus was arrested, back then before Jesus was, uh, you know what, tried and, 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 and crucified, to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ was a cool status. A cool thing. Something that you're proud of. Something that you brag, of, brag about. After seeing miracles upon miracles, multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish. When you're asked during those times if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I think you would readily say so. Peter readily said so. The rest of the other disciples readily said so. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the most famous preacher, the most famous prophet of that time. And not just an ordinary prophet or teacher, he is the son of God in human body. But in this point in time, to say that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it will cost you your life. It might cost you your life. And so therefore, Peter denied that he knew the Lord. And the rest of the other apostles, except John the Beloved, hid in fear. You might be saying, if I was there, I would have not done what Peter did and the other disciples. I don't know about you, but I think the pandemic has exposed our limitations, our weaknesses, and our frailties, especially when it comes to our devotion to our Lord. It is not just Peter who was exposed as far as limitations, as far as like failure to be faithful to the very end. The Bible said, he that shall be shaken shall be shaken. There will be shakenings that will happen or shakings that will take place in this world intended to expose who are those who are fully committed and devoted to God. But what happens when we're exposed? What do we do? Stay with me. This story 
is for you and for me. So Peter had to know his limits, had to know his limitations. Jesus knew his limitations. Jesus knew his weaknesses. But Peter didn't know about it yet. So Jesus wanted to bring out that knowledge. He wanted to see if Peter is ready for what he's about to give to him. You know, in our world, it's a world that is focused on success, especially in the Western world, especially in affluent countries like Canada. It's all about success, and success is measured by status. Success is measured by fortune. You know what? Let me tell you, in the economy of God, in the agenda of God, success, the way we think, is not success in the eyes of God. In fact, in order for us to be a candidate to God's success, we have to be failures first. And when we get to know our limitations and our weaknesses, then limit, let me tell you, the sky is the limit. Because when we are weak, Paul said, then we know the strength and the power that God provides. You know, I was raised up, most of you know the story, I was raised up by a, by a former gangster. Machismo is the, the language in our home. Machismo is the language in the Philippines. When you're a man, you don't cry. When I was a boy, when I was about to cry, my father said, you're a tough boy, don't cry. And so I was forced to hide my, my, my pain and my aches, and, and I don't cry in front of my father especially. But I, but I cried in secret. A lot of us are crying in secret. Why? Because we're in a society that when there is weakness, we don't expose weakness, especially our own. We're easy to expose the weaknesses of others, but we're not quick to expose our own weakness. Why? Because that's a shame. That is not something that should be done. If you look at this story, Jesus was doing the opposite. He was trying to bring to the knowledge of Peter his weakness he was trying to bring to the surface what caused the failure. Not to put Peter down, not to condemn Peter, but to empower Peter. And to launch him to a future without failure anymore. <laughs> and so the conversation is needed. This dialogue is required. This encounter is a must so that Peter can be the Peter that God wanted him to be. If you look at this without going to the original dialect or the original language, then you will miss the point. Because in, 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 in Greek, the New Testament was written in gr Greek. Like the word love, there are different words for love and different meanings like eros, erotic, like phileo, brotherly love, agape, which is the God kind of love, the unconditional love. And so when Jesus was asking the question, he asked at first the word agape. He said, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me through all kinds of seasons, through all kinds of circumstances? Do you love me in the good times and in the bad times? In the same way that God loves you unconditionally. The response of Peter was, I feel you. That's all that I can do. I can only love you during the good times. Because I have discovered during the bad times, I deny that I knew you three times. Lord, I fillet you. There was no question about love. Peter loved the Lord. In fact, the moment he knew it was the Lord on the shore, he jumped out of the boat, waded the water, and tried to be the first to meet the Lord. That was love. That was devotion. But all he can muster was phileo. I love you because ah, we're, we're having good times right now. <laughs> But when it's going to be tough, I think I'm going to run away again. I'm going to deny that I know you again. We have heard of the state in the States called Philadelphia. It's called the land of brotherly love. I love you because you love me. That's all that it, that it means or meant. Good times, good relationship, everything is good, then I can love you. No question about it. But the moment you're mad at me, the moment you hate me, the moment you don't give me my needs, the moment you, owe, you, you know what, you cause me pain, then I cannot love you further. In fact, I will be bitter. I will, be, I, will, I will betray. I will run away. I will not be committed to the very end. So, you know, Peter was saying, in essence, this is all I got. 
The second question, again, is the same word. Jesus asked him, do you agape me? Do you love me even though it, there's going to be some persecutions and sufferings? And, and it's not all about, you know, good stuff. It's not the way the world defines success. Success in my kingdom is suffering to the very end, serving to the very end. It's enduring faith and enduring service to me and to others. Do you agape me? And the response of Peter was the same. I phileo you. I cannot promise that I will die for you. I cannot promise that I will go to prison with you because I have failed miserably. Again, he was honest of his weaknesses, of his human frailty and failure. The third time Jesus asked him the question, he went to the level of Peter and said, Do you phileo me? And that's when Peter was sad. <laughs> Why? Because now he realized Jesus knew who he really was, what he really possessed. Because at the beginning, for three years, all he did was come up with a facade, a front. I'm a good guy. I'm a great follower. I am the best disciple amongst the 12. You should pick me. You should pick Choose me as the leader of the band, the leader of the disciples, because I'm willing to die for you and go to prison with you. Now he realized Jesus knew what was really happening on the inside of this man. Jesus knew that all you can muster is phileo. Loving me when I bless you with a house, if I bless you with a car, if I bless you with $40 per hour, or if I bless you with $20 per minute, that's all you can master. Love me when everything is okay. When you know what? The sun is shining. You will love me. You will serve me. When everything is fine and every, everybody is applauding you, that's all that you can master. That's all that you can do. And if you're honest with it, I'll give you a surprise. I'll give you something you could have not imagined possible. Only possible because of God's love for people like you. You know the Old Covenant, the Old Testament that God gave through Moses? It's all about promises and commitments. The New Covenant is different. The New Covenant, it's all about honesty and responding to God's love. That's it. God is not asking for promises from us. God is not asking commitments from us that he, he knows that you and I cannot fulfill. The way to enter into a relationship with God is admit I am a sinner. Admit I'm going to hell with, without Jesus. And I cannot stay faithful without His grace, without His power, without His help. If we started in grace, how come we are not continuing in grace? How come we're acting as if we are the ones who are full of the love of God we are full of the power of God on our own. And then we question ourselves and even God, why are we struggling? Why are we going through tough times and yet we are not growing? We are not producing the results or the fruits that God requires of us. Because my friends, we are no longer in the old covenant. We are now in the new covenant. God is constantly reminding us that we are failures on our own. We are weak on our own. But the moment we come to that realization, then the grace of God, the love of God, and the power of God, God will infuse us with. Peter was mistaken for three years. He thought serving God and following Jesus was all about coming up with a facade, coming up with, you know what, a superficial strength and greatness and power. No. He now realized it was impossible to follow Jesus. It's impossible to serve Jesus. But Jesus can make it possible by His grace, and by His love. And all that is required of Peter, the same is required of us. Admit the impossible. Admit our weaknesses. Admit our failures. The moment Peter acknowledges human reality, God gave him a taste of divinity. The moment there was admission, the moment there was realization, the moment there was acknowledgement, I am a failure. 
I'm a sinner. I am good for nothing. I can only love you the filet way. I can only love you when times are good. When times are bad, I will not be loving. And when that happened, the love of God took over. Imagine here the story was surrounded by the love of God, immersed in the love of God, the, the, the miracle catch. It was the second miracle catch. The first was in Luke chapter 5 that launched them to follow Jesus, that got the ball rolling for them to become followers of Jesus Christ. Expert fishermen couldn't catch a single fish. And Jesus gave them a miracle catch. That launched them into following Jesus. This one is the second time around. It was a different situation because Peter failed miserably. He was condemned. He was guilty. And they were confused. That's why they went back to fishing. A lot of us during this pandemic or before the pandemic, we were sure, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I love Jesus. I'm going to serve. I'm going to die for Him. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to pray for people to be saved. I'm going to lead them to Christ. I'm, I'm going to lead cell groups. And lo and behold, after two years of pandemic, we don't know even if we're Christians. Are we truly Christians? Are we really followers of Jesus Christ? Similar to Peter. That's why he went back to fishing. Some of us are trying to go back to drinking. Some of us are trying to go back to, you know what, things that we're not supposed to look at online. We're tempted to go back to our old life. We're tempted to go back to our own lifestyle that is not according to the plan of God. We're tempted to go back to our own plans. Peter and his friends were tempted to go back fishing. There's nothing wrong with fishing. What was wrong is that they were already called out of it. Remember? They were already called out of fishing. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. No longer fishing for fish. But the internal pain and the internal struggle and confusion was so great. But they decided to go back. Try a taste of the life that we used to have. But the good thing about the love of God, He will not stay at a high level and wait for us to come. The story of the New Testament is not God at a high level waiting to be approached. The story of the New Testament, the narrative of the New Testament is that Jesus came from His lofty position and searched for that one lost sheep. Jesus went where they decided to go away from the call of God. He met them there. And you might be saying, well, you know what? God is only in churches. Let me tell you, God can be found in bars. I'm not saying you guys go to bars and say, God is here. No, it means that God is searching for one, that one lost sheep even in bars. Even in places that you think is not a place for God. In fact, this is just a building. The moment we're gone, this is just an empty building. God goes where people are. And if it's, if it, if it's supposed to be a bar where, where, you know what, there are people there longing and looking and searching for God, happiness and fulfillment and joy, and yet they cannot find it. They cannot find it with another glass or shot of Johnny Walker and all kinds of things to take and in and out of those bars, and yet God knows there are people who are crying out for help, crying out for support, crying out for love. Let me tell you, God will go there. But for the most part, God needs Christians to go there as well sometimes. Be sure it's an assignment from the Lord. Be sure you got your pastor's blessing and prayer. Because there was a man by the name of Ralph Neighbor. He was a pastor, a Baptist pastor. At one time, he was praying, and the Lord said, go to a bar. And he said, Lord, why do I go to a bar? I'm a Baptist pastor. Baptist pastor, because there are a lot of people there that are in need of my love. So he went into the bar, but he told the church first, guys, he had a 300-member church, and he said, I'm going to a bar, I'm going to order milk, and I'm going to love people there to Christ. And he went there. The moment he went there, he ordered for a milk. And he said, do you have milk? Strangely, in a bar, there was milk. Milk on the rocks. 
And lo and behold, he struck some conversation with one guy at the right and one guy to the left until finally the story said he was able to bring, I think, hundreds of people to Christ and baptize them in water. Because my friends, God goes where people are. Jesus met them where they were trying to run away from the original call to follow Jesus and fish for men. They were going back to where they were called from by the Lord. And God gave them another miracle catch. And God, even Jesus, prepared breakfast. Imagine breakfast. You know, when you go to like uh, Best Western in the States, I love going to Best Western in the States because they have such good breakfast, continental breakfast, conti lang, few food and stuff. That's why it's continental breakfast. And, and, and you know what? This breakfast is special. This breakfast is the best because Jesus prepared the breakfast. Isn't that immersed, saturated with love? And then lo and behold, when Peter was ready, because he admitted he was a failure, he admitted he can only love Phileo. <laughs> oh, he can only love the McDonald's way. Why? Phileo fish. <laughs> That's all I can do, Jesus. That's all I can do. If you give me fish, I'll be happy. I love you. The moment he was ready, the moment he was willing, the moment he was honest, the Lord spoke a prophetic future, and he said, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus was speaking what, G what Peter failed to do. Jesus was speaking into the future of Peter and said, you have failed me by your own strength in the past, by my own power and love, you will not fail me again. You will die for me and glorify me. And then Jesus said, now follow me. Before you were following your own idea, your self-confidence, your self-righteousness, your own strength. Now that you're done, now that you have known your limitations, now that you have known your frailty and weaknesses, I start providing you the ability to be faithful to the very end. Now, follow me. Are you getting this? Can you see the transition? I don't need a commitment from you. I don't need a promise from you. I want you to listen to me first. I want you to know the love that I have for you. I want you to, I want you to know the power that I will provide you. And the moment you get to know that, then follow me. Because now you have the ability to follow me no matter what happens to you. You are not just going to love me the filet way. You're going to love me with my love. Because I have spoken into that emptiness of yours. I have spoken into that weakness of yours. I have provided you my strength and my love. Now you can follow me. Now you can make a commitment based on responding to me. Not on your own. Not self-confidence, not self-righteousness. But knowing your limitations, knowing your weaknesses, knowing that apart from me, you are nothing. In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, it says here, God's agape love never fails. God's love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. If you read the original Word, it's agape. It's not phileo. Phileo will fail. All kinds of human love will fail. But God's love will never fail. And so Jesus surrounded him with love. Saturated that moment with love. And then spoke with love and authority and power to Peter. At your end, my power and my love begin. Where are you at at this point? Are you still trying to please God or impress people around you and, and say that, oh, I'm a good person, I'm a good Christian, 
I've not done anything wrong. And yet, lo and behold, our life is a mess. Our life is not really a reflection of God living in us and through us. It's okay. It's okay because God is at work. But I hope that we cooperate early so that our mess can become messages, so that our tests can become testimonies. Because the moment we admit our limitations, the moment we come to the end of our own confidence in self, that's the only time God begins. That's the only time God will manifest His divinity, His power, and His love. And that's the only time you and I can have a secure future where serving others is definitely part of that life. Amen? We cannot say that we love God. We cannot say that we have the love of God and we're not serving God. We're not serving others. When Paul wrote about being compelled by love, he was speaking of his life of service, his life of sacrifice, his life of even dying for Christ or whatever he did during this time, during his lifetime, after he gave his life to Christ. It was all because of the love of God that was in him. Because he himself experienced what Peter experienced. He came to the end of his own righteousness, own strength, and own love. And when that happened, God began filling him up with his love, with his power, with his greatness. And that's the only way he was able to do what he accomplished because of the love of God on the inside of us. We're having a, a water baptismal service here. Similar to what, you, what many of us experience, what brought us to water baptism is not because we're good people. We're righteous people. No, because we have discovered that we are sinners. We have realized through the gospel that we are going to hell without Jesus. There's nothing in me, there's nothing in us that can make God forgive us, and make us righteous and welcome us to heaven on our own. No, it's all because of the grace and the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's all. Admitting we are sinners, admitting we need the Savior, admitting that Jesus' death on the cross is enough payment for our sins, admitting and acknowledging that Jesus alone can forgive us of our sins and save us from the consequences of sin. That makes us a Christian. That makes us part of God's family. And that's why we're doing this water baptism. But it doesn't end here. It starts here. In our lifetime, we will be like Peter. We will fail. We will fumble. We will stumble. But hey, just like what John Maxwell said, we can fail forward, meaning forward into the arms of Jesus. If you're failing, if you're struggling, if you're in a mess, and you know it's because of your weakness, it's because of your limitations, then don't run away from Jesus. Run to Jesus. Fail forward. You got that? I've been a Christian for 34 years. It, it's far from being perfect. I don't, I don't have it all together in me. In fact, there are times that I question my Christianity. There are times that I, I'm confused like Peter. Lord, should I just go back to being a civil engineer? Well, I studied for six years. I passed the board exam. I love what I see as far as construction in Winnipeg. It would definitely be a lucrative profession. If I become a civil engineer here in Winnipeg, in Manitoba, and even across Canada. Wow! Lord! I can still be a pastor. Part-time. I want to be a full-time engineer, Lord. Wow! That would be nice. There are times that I was tempted to stop and quit being a pastor. There are times that I'm confused. Am I really called to be a pastor? There are times that I said, probably I'm done. I'm been a pastor here for 23 years two more years for 25 and I'll resign and I'll retire and quit and all kinds of stuff there are thoughts running in my mind the wheels were turning in the past but yet you know what every time I'm confused every time I was struggling every time I I don't know what to do I just simply say Lord can you please talk to me <laughs> Lord I need you Lord I need your help and God faithfully spoke. God faithfully communicated back. And 
said, My grace is sufficient. When you are weak, then I'm stronger in your life. That's what you call failing forward. Not failing backwards, not running away from God, not run away, running away from Jesus. I'm struggling. I'm a mess. I have failed miserably. Fail forward to Jesus. He has a breakfast waiting for you. <laughs> he has God moments of miracles of love and kindness prepared for you. He has a word that is secure and assuring you of a great life and future. According to God's plan of what success is all about. Being, being faithful to, the, to Him to the very end. Enduring faith. Enduring service to God and others. Amen? How many of you here, you're ready for God's love and God's strength? Raise up your hand. You're struggling. You're in a mess. You don't know what to do. You're confused like Peter. But you don't want to fail backwards. You want to fail forward to Jesus. Come on, raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. I want you to stand up. You say, I want to fail forward to Jesus. Come on, stand up. Those who raise up their hands. Thank you. Thank you. You're ready now to fail forward? God will catch you. Jesus will catch you. God will speak a bright and great future like you have never imagined or thought before. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you indeed work all things together for our good. God, we have failed. We have been a mess in so many ways. But I thank you, Lord, that the story of your conversation with Peter encouraged all of us to hope in you, to fail forward in the direction of your arms. God, if there is anybody that should be counted out, disqualified from the game, it should be Peter. And yet, you have prepared this breakfast on the beach so that you can express your love to Peter and propel him to an amazing life of serving you to the very end and being faithful and never failing again. Thank you for this story. Thank you for this conversation. And now, God, I pray that you give, give each and every one of us a similar conversation with you, a similar encounter with you, a lot of us are failing miserably. A lot of us are in a mess because of our weaknesses, because of our struggles, because of our frailty. And right now, Lord, infuse us with your love. Infuse us with your power. Infuse us, Lord God, with your presence like never before. Touch the hurting and the broken and the wounded. Let them know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you love them and you have an amazing plan for their lives and their future. God, may this be a similar encounter, Lord, for each and every one of us, similar to what Peter experienced in John 21. Thank you, God. Your encounters with us, your conversation with us is definitely the difference that we need and we long for. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your, you're the God of second chances. Thank you. You can turn us into champions of faith as well. Like Peter. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap. We can all be seated. We got two candidates today for water baptism. Invite the women to go up first, come up here on the stage. Yeah. Hello, ladies. Hello, April. Oops, careful. Sorry, sorry. okay you know water baptism is not about us being good godly and righteous in fact it's all about us being sinners and Jesus loved us still 
died on the cross for us, rose again to show to us that we are now acceptable in the eyes of God because of what He did for us. So thank you for making this commitment, April. Commitment to make Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life? Do you promise to be faithful to the Lord by His help and grace to the very end? That no amount of trials and hardships will cause you to turn your back away from Him. April, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Woohoo! Congratulations, April. Powell, please. Mark Chorley. Mark Chorley is our Taekwondo instructor. For... We have a free Taekwondo class, and I think we resumed last March. And it's an honor and a privilege to see Mark make this commitment of his faith and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through water baptism. Mark is Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of your life. Do you promise to be faithful to Him by His grace to the very end? Mark Chorley, Sifu, Sensei, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Woohoo! Congratulations, Mark. Sifu. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be the whole body, Mark. <laughs> Come on, let's give the Lord a clap. Let's all stand up. Wow, wow. Again, again, guys, Christianity is not all about showing a facade of greatness. It's not about showing a facade of strength. No, Christianity is a response to the love of God. In spite of us or despite of us being sinners, in spite of us being in a mess, in spite of us who couldn't even hold ourselves together on our own, let me tell you, Jesus still loves you. Jesus cares about you and He has an amazing plan and future for you. If only you will turn your life over to Him. Stop running away from Him. It said, fail forward. Run to Jesus. Let's all stand up as I conclude in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you. Thank you for this day. As we have witnessed two lives make a public confession of their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I thank you for your love and mercy and forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, for touching lives. Thank you for touching people here today. And Lord God, we thank you that nothing can separate us from your love. Because you will love us to the very end. Even though, Lord, at times we will fail, even though at times we will mess up, your love will still remain the same. Thank you, God. And Lord God, as we celebrate our 25th anniversary, Lord, we, I pray that you guide us as to what is life and ministry beyond 25 years. And Lord God, cause this coming Sunday to be such a powerful celebration of your love, of your goodness, and of your faithfulness. This we pray, O oh God. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen and Amen. God bless you guys. See you next Sunday. Thank you.
about IWC, please visit our website, Facebook page, and our Instagram. Finally, I pray for God's blessing to be with you and your family always. See you next Sunday.